So hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us again in this MyNet 2 course on reducing uncertainty in techno-economic analysis of ocean energy. So I'll start now. Um, we are on our day two of the course. So for those of you who tuned in yesterday, welcome back and maybe get yourself some tea for this beginning because I'll be doing a bit of a repetition of the introduction for any newcomers. My name is Noor van Velzen. I work at the University of Edinburgh in the Policy and Innovation Group. And together with WaveApp Offshore Renewable, Renewables in Portugal, we have prepared this course as part of the EU-funded MINA2 project. So MINA2 um, is a project with more than 30 pro project partners, and it provides testing opportunities for marine renewables through the Transnational Access Program. And it also provides training opportunities through a wide range of courses. And then this course is one of them. So, so far, these courses have been in real life at the different project partners. But of course, in these times, uh, we decided to move this course online in the form of a webinar series. So we prepared three topics for you over three days of about one and a half to two hour sessions with the overarching topic of how to deal with uncertainty. And together they make up the course, but you can also tune in separately, which is why I'm repeating this introduction. Um, so throughout the three days, you'll be listening to team members of the Policy and Innovation Group and WAVEC Offshore Renewables. Just a quick overview of what we do. So in the Policy and Innovation Group, uh, which is led by Henry Jeffrey at the University of Edinburgh, we focus on techno-economic, socio-economic and environmental assessments of offshore renewables. And we also look at strategy planning and road mapping. At WAVAC Offshore Renewables, they work on complex systems engineering considering instrumentation uh, and data acquisition, environmental monitoring, logistics, policy advice, and project development for marine renewables, as well as aquaculture and ocean engineering solutions. So now some information on this webinar format. Um, it will be recorded and made available on the, together with the slides on the MINA2 website. Um, all the attendee microphones are muted and we would like to ask you to send us your questions at any time through the panel that you can see on the right there um, because we will be having different question sessions throughout as we did yesterday. Um, so talking about yesterday, we um, learned from, uh, oh, I went too quickly there. We learned uh, from our speakers yesterday, Maria Vanegas Cantarero and Amorina Amayor, about uh, levelized cost of energy, LCOE, and the components that are considered in LCOE calculations. They also highlighted that with ocean energy, due to its early stage of development, their techno-economic assessments are associated with high uncertainties. So, I just want to mention two tips that they mentioned, uh, which are uh, to be critical of input data and sources and be transparent in your assumptions of techno-economic assessments. That was day one yesterday, which as I mentioned, will be available on the Marina2 website and you'll receive an email uh, when it is available. And then for today, we will hear from research associates, associates at the University of Edinburgh, Shona Pennock and Anna Garcia Teruel, who have both an impressive range of knowledge from life cycle assessments to techno economic assessments and the additional value of marine renewables when added to the grid, as well as optimized device designs. And so today, 
uh, they will take you through the topic of innovation and learning. So that's me for the introduction. And Shona, the screen is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Noor. I will share my screen. Can you give me the screen, Noor? I should be able to. Okay, there we go. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And hi, everyone. Um, and yeah, welcome to the course. We're sorry not to be able to welcome you in Edinburgh, but if it helps, it's very rainy in Scotland today, so <laughs> you're not missing on the weather. Um, today, we'll focus on innovation and learning. So we'll start with some introductory slides on innovation and why it is important to the offshore renewable energy sector. Then we'll move on to focus on how innovation can be quantified through learning curves. Some examples of how learning curves are used, what uncertainties and limitations are associated with using learning curves, and how we can maximise learning potential in offshore renewables. We'll pass between Anna and myself for each of these bullet points, and we'll take regular breaks to stop for questions. So please let us know any of your questions throughout. So what is innovation and why is this important in the energy sector? Our first question is, what is innovation? A quick Google will find many answers on how to define innovation. It could be the application of ideas that are novel and useful, or a product, service, or process or experience with a viable business model that's perceived as new or adapted by, cost, by customers, or any variation on these answers, as long as it's something new which addresses customer requirements. And this is really the crux of how we're defining innovation in this course. Innovation can be any novel idea which has either commercial or social value. So why is innovation particularly important to the energy sector? As we aim to achieve long-term goals for greenhouse emission reduction in an affordable way, whilst maintaining energy security, we're seeing policymakers and project developers focus their attention on offshore renewables. There is a great deal of scope for innovation to develop novel ideas for offshore renewables be that in transferring existing technologies to the marine environment or developing new concepts to generate electricity from the wind, waves and tides. However, many of these technologies are still at a relatively early stage. And so innovation is also important to reduce the cost of energy. This plot shows comparative costs and cost reduction potentials for a range of technologies. The solid bars indicate current cost ranges as of 2015 while shaded bars indicate the expected future costs reductions. It can be seen on the two bars on the left that wave and tidal energy require a significant amount of cost reduction still to become competitive with other forms of generation. But as we can remember from yesterday's presentation on levelized cost of energy calculations, there are a range of cost components that make up LCOE. You'll remember that the LCOE is the net present value of all of these lifetime costs divided by the net present value of lifetime energy production. We can use innovation to develop low cost solutions in terms of the project capex, the cost of the project development, a device and balance a plant. We can also focus on innovative procedures and vessels for marine operations to reduce project opex. And we can develop innovations in both devices and maintenance strategies, which would allow us to maximize the annual energy production. Any of these innovations would result in a reduction in our overall LCOE. Another reminder of yesterday's presentation is also that some of the costs make up a higher proportion of the LCOE. So innovation might be focused on cost centers, which make up the majority of the overall project costs. On this plot, this could be either the device or the OPEX, shown as the largest portions of this pie chart. Or we could focus innovation on cost centers which have the highest scope for innovation. For example, an innovative mooring system. This will also depend on the scope for technology transfer. For example, while it's clear that a good amount of technology transfer is possible between similar technologies and onshore and offshore wind, 
there has still been a great deal of scope for innovation in developing marine operations for offshore installation and maintenance and in upscaling devices. More recently, floating platforms and associated mooring and anchoring systems have been developed. When we look at other offshore renewables, we can also see the scope for technology transfer. Many tidal stream devices are installed are using a horizontal axis concept similar to that used in wind. However, these devices are installed and operated in a submarine environment, and so many of the key components of these devices have had to be adapted to ensure reliable and efficient operation within a very different environment compared with the existing wind technologies. Like wind, both bottom fixed and floating technologies are being developed for tidal stream devices. Finally, wave energy devices under development might take many different forms and don't show design convergence in the same way as these other offshore renewable technologies. There's still a great deal of scope for innovative technologies, components and services for wave energy, and thus also a great deal of scope for cost reduction. Overall, as we move along these images from left to right on this slide, we see a range of energy generation technologies at different levels of maturity and with differing scopes of technology transfer and innovation, where technology transfer is not possible or needs significant adaption. We saw on the previous slide that the more nascent technologies of wave and tidal stream are currently at a considerably higher LCOE compared with offshore wind, but also the scope for a considerable amount of cost reduction. So, how do we assess the potential impacts from innovation? Technological innovation in the energy sector is driven by a combination of incentives and interests. It's a major policy and research challenge to understand the impact of different initiatives and programmes on technological innovation. And this impact can be studied at different levels, from a broad socio-political perspective to the specific cost reductions achieved for a given technology. For this reason, there are a number of approaches that are used at aiming at quantifying the innovation impact. Innovation studies, in general terms, may aim at answering the question how effective are different policy initiatives, investment or research programmes. Whereas technology roadmaps focus on investigating where the best strategy is to achieve the required cost reductions for a given technology. Finally, energy system models may start from the premise that a cost reduction is achieved for a given technology and aim at understanding what impact this has on the market, the energy system mix and the resultant carbon intensity of the energy system. As you can see from this figure, a number of approaches exist which deal with assessing the impact of innovation. On the right, we have more process oriented approaches that aim at providing context for the innovation process and qualitatively describing this process. On the left, we have more output oriented approaches where the actual innovation mechanisms are abstracted, but where innovation impacts such as expected cost reductions, expected installed capacity of a, te of a technology in a year can be quantified. Learning curves, listed on the bottom left here, are used to quantify the impact of innovation in terms of cost reduction and will be the focus of today's presentation. And with that, I'll move on to Anna um, to talk about how learning and learning curves are defined. Thank you. Um, thanks. I'm just going to check that I can pass the slide. Yeah, OK. So good morning, everyone, from my side as well, and welcome to the course again. Uh, so within the topic of learning, as as Jonah was mentioning, and in particular in particular within the topic of learning as a way of quantifying the impact of innovations in terms of cost reductions, we will look into one how are learning and learning curves defined, two how are learning curves used. Three, uh, what uncertainties and limitations are associated with learning curves? And finally, how can we maximize learning potential? And we will start. With uh, how are learning and learning curves defined? So to start with, I would like to discuss what are. Sorry. Okay, to start with, I would like to discuss what are uh, learning and learning processes and uh, what are examples of factors that drive learning. 
the most commonly discussed form of learning is the so-called learning by doing and it is that is for example if one component is manufactured repeatedly more efficient manufacturing processes can be put in place that will reduce the cost of manufacturing for example to manufacture uh, turbine blades additionally as a component or system is deployed and used experience will be gained that can result in further cost reductions for example if a number of turbines have been installed offshore the installation time per turbine may be reduced as experience in the process increases another uh, commonly discussed source of learning is the so-called learning by research which includes technological improvements achieved through research activities and this includes for example the development of new materials for turbine blades that improve their fatigue life and therefore can result in significant cost reductions. Another driver of learning is uh, learning by adaptation, where... I'm sorry, I'm having trouble to pass the slides. Okay, another driver of learning is learning by adaptation, where um, existing knowledge from another sector is used. For example, within uh, the floating offshore wind sector, a lot of learning can occur by adaptation from previous onshore wind, bottom fixed offshore wind, and oil and gas experience, for example, as, as we were mentioning before. Um, but as we mentioned before as well, some technologies might be able to use a lot of the existing experience, as is the case for, for floating offshore wind, but some will not, as might be the case for, for wave energy. Another source of learning is the so-called uh, learning by interaction, which represents the idea that if three people are working on the same thing separately, more and faster improvements can be achieved if the resources and efforts are shared than if no knowledge is exchanged between these, these three people. Examples for collaboration platforms that aim at improving learning by interaction are, for example, <clears throat> initiatives such as Supergen Marine in the UK, or the International Energy Agency, which is the Ocean Energy Systems Technology Collaboration Program at international level. Finally, another significant effect that is often considered um, is the effect um, that upscaling can have on cost reductions. And this was the case for onshore and offshore wind turbines, where cost reductions were partly achieved through a rapid upscaling of the turbine rating, through increases in blade lengths and rotor diam diameters. Of course, there will be other factors that will positively or negatively affect the learning process, for example, the political framework, but the effects of these factors on the learning process can generally be associated to the sources um, of learning that are listed here. So now that the different sources of learning have been identified, we can look at how are these learning processes then quantified. And so to quantify learning, the so-called learning curve is used. And a learning curve in this context most commonly describes a reduction in cost with an increase in, for example, um, in cumulative deployment or energy generation. And generally, on the y-axis, we have the parameter that is expected to decrease with learning. And this can be, for example, a cost per per kilowatt in terms of um, capital expenditures or the levelized cost of energy or the cost of energy. On the x-axis, we generally show the main fac factor used to describe this cost reduction. And for a uh, learning by doing process linked to the deployment experience, you can look, for example, at cumulative installed capacity or cumulative energy produced, etc. In different studies, different x and y axis uh, parameters are used and so one should pay particular attention to this when comparing learning curves for for different technologies and as it is shown here we would be looking at the reduction in the levelized cost of energy with increasing cumulative deployment and so we would be representing the overall expected learning process based on the learning by doing concept this does not mean that learning by doing will be the only source of learning but that we are approximating all of the learning effects through one single factor, which is this increase in experience represented as the increase in cumulative deployment. Um, however, learning curves can be defined as single, two, and multi-factor learning curves. 
and if you're just describing uh, your learning curve based on one factor as in the curve introduced before this is called a single factor learning curve and this represents the learning process through the learning by doing effects usually represented through cumulative capacity or cumulative energy produced and single factor learning curves are the most commonly used type of, of learning curves due to their simplicity. Two-factor learning curves are also used where learning is not only represented through the learning by doing process but also through learning by research and learning by research is commonly uh, represented based on the increase in knowledge stock which is calculated based on for example the number of patents filed over time or the amount of R&D investment. However, as discussed before, there are a number of sources of learning and for this reason, in some studies, multi-factor learning curves have been applied where additional factors have been used to describe additional learning sources. For example, upscaling, uh, upscaling effects have been considered through increase in single device rating over time. Multi-factor learning curves require a lot of data to be defined and so they are the least commonly used. Although no However, although no causal relationship can be established with learning curves, so for what resulted in a technology's cost uh, reductions, multi-factor learning curves are an interesting tool to better represent cost fluctuations and to investigate what factors could, could have contributed to cost reductions in the past. So we have seen uh, single-factor learning curves, but how do two-factor and multi-factor learning curves look like? Basically, they look the same. Here, um, we can see an example for a two-factor learning curve where R&D investment is used additionally to cumulative capacity to represent the learning. And so we can see with the blue single-factor learning curve, cost reductions are only represented with an increase in cumulative capacity, whereas with the orange uh, two-factor learning curve, cost reductions are reduced with both increasing cumulative capacity and increasing um, R&D investment. And here we can see another example where single factor, two factor, three and four factor learning curves were developed uh, to represent the development of the costs for um, offshore wind. And in this case, all the learning processes took place, the overall cost of the technology shown with the blue dots was not reduced amongst others due to an increase in the raw material prices. So in this case, uh, multi-factor learning curves were developed because the single factor learning curve did not reflect the LCOE change over time for this technology. And so in an attempt to better represent this cost fluctuation that we can see on the figure, other factors were, were taken into account. In this case, the variation of the weighted average cost of capital, the water depth, and the price of steel. Although offshore wind has been developed for a number of years now, and it is becoming very competitive in the energy market, a historical learning curve cannot be drawn because uh, costs have not been consistently decreasing for long enough. And so even though learning processes have taken place over this time, a learning curve cannot be established or at least not through the common approaches. Uh, but for the present course, we will be focusing on single factor learning curves. And mathematically, they are defined as represented here, where the cost or price at a certain uh, installed or deployed capacity is defined by the cost of the first unit of installed capacity the amount of installed capacity, for example, three units of one megawatt, and the progress ratio, which is one minus the learning rate, and which describes how fast costs are reduced. And that is the learning rate represents the percentage of cost or price reduction for each doubling of the installed capacity. And this is, we will discuss this now more graphically in the next slides slides, sorry, uh, so hopefully this will help you visualize what we are talking about here. So the, as you can see from this figure, for a learning rate of 10%, as we double the capacity from 10 
to 20 megawatts, the cost of the deployed capacity is reduced by 10%. As we further double the capacity from 20 to 40 megawatts, the cost of the deployed capacity is again reduced by 10% and so on. Since the learning curve is, based, um, is defined based on the doubling of the capacity, it will become more and more difficult to reduce the costs as the cumulative capacity increases. And so we can see that the learning curve is defined so that as the technology becomes more and more mature, less cost reductions are expected. And depending on the value of the learning rate, the curve will be more or less steep. And so for higher learning rates, cost reductions are achieved faster. So here, as before, we can see a learning curve where the starting situation with an LCOE of 300 pounds per megawatt hour and 10 megawatts of installed capacity represents the current state of tidal stream technologies. And for example, for this technology to achieve an LCOE of 150 pounds per megawatt hour with a learning rate of 10%, about 1,000 megawatts of cumulative installed capacity are required. Whereas if the learning rate is of 20%, this LCOE value can be achieved after 80 megawatts of installed capacity, which is a significant difference. To show you an example of how the learning curve is calculated, oh, well, apologies for the, for the slide. Um, uh, so yeah, to show you an example of how the learning curve is calculated and what values are assigned to each parameter, we will now go through a similar example as represented in the previous figure. So let's say we want to calculate the cost of deploying a one megawatt wave energy converter that today costs 500 pounds per megawatt hour. And after installing one gigawatt and so 1000 units of that wave energy converter, while assuming a 10% learning rate, then this is how our parameters would be defined. And the equation with the inserted numbers would look like this. And the LCOE then for a one megawatt wave energy converter that would be installed after having installed one gigawatt of those wave energy converters would be about 175 pounds per megawatt hour. If we instead assume a learning rate of 15%, the LCOE for that deployment becomes about 99 uh, pounds per megawatt hour. So this hopefully um, shows you how um, a learning curve would be calculated. And then finally, on the definition of uh, learning curves, since we will be discussing learning curves in further detail in the rest of the presentation and showing you a number of learning curve examples, we would like to make you aware that there's a number of ways in which learning curves are plotted. So if using a linear scale for both the X and Y axis, the learning curve, which is a logarithmic curve, looks like on the graph on the left. However, since the value in the Y axis is always doubled, the learning curve is also often represented using a logarithmic scale in the X axis, which is shown in the graph in the middle. Finally, in some cases, learning curves are represented using uh, logarithmic scales in both axes and so that the learning curve looks like a straight line as on the graph on the right. So the, the curve represented in these three graphs is the exact same curve, but just using these different axis scales. So after introducing the topic of innovation and how learning curves are defined, which helps us quantify cost reductions due to innovation, we can have a break for questions on, on these topics. Thank you, Anna and Shona. Um, so I'll start with a question on the different sources of learning. So you mentioned uh, learning sources, sources, for example, learning by doing or learning by research. Uh, are all of these included with learning rates or can they be separate learning rates for different sources of learning? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Noor. Yeah, that's a good question. So if, if we have a single factor learning curve, then we would only have uh, one learning rate um, to represent the overall learning process based on the learning by doing effects. 
if we have a two-factor learning curve, then we would have two learning rates, uh, one to represent the learning by doing process and one to represent the learning by research process. And in this case, the learning by doing learning rate would be lower than the one estimated for a single-factor learning curve, since in the in the case of the single-factor learning curve, the whole learning process is approximated with one single effect, whereas in the latter case, where we have a two-factor learning curve, um, we are splitting the representation of learning into two learning effects. And so the learning by doing learning rate would be different if we're using a single-factor learning curve or a two-factor learning curve. And we would have um, learning rates for each of the factors represented in the learning curve. I think. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, and then I'll ask a question on um, the, the axes that you put it against. So you mentioned that the cost reduction uh, could be represented in cumulative capacity or community, cumulative cumulative, sorry, energy generation. Um, do you think, do, does it change the chosen learning rate when you vary the, the type of costs that are being considered? So if you look at uh, cumulative capacity or uh, cumulative uh, energy generation, and that also applies to when you look at CAPEX reduction versus LCOE reductions. Yeah, yeah. So one should be um, careful with that because yes, the learning rate would be different depending on the parameters that you use in the X and Y axis. And so, for example, if we look at um, cap capex cost reductions, um, you could expect a lower learning rate than if looking at LCOE cost reductions. And that is because LCOE will contain not only capex cost reductions but also um, OPEX cost reductions and uh, maybe increases in annual energy production, which overall we could expect that would result in a higher learning rate or a higher learning rate value than if only considering um, CAPEX cost reductions. So yeah, the learning rate will depend on um, what we choose to, to represent in our, with our learning curve. Yeah. Okay, and then I'll, I'll ask a final question for this session. So um, already, again, coming back to cumulative capacity and the learning uh, that goes with that, for devices with a lower rated power, um, this would mean that you would install more devices uh, to get that deployed capacity uh, when you compare it to devices with a higher rated, power, uh, rated capacity. So for that reason, would the use of units instead of cumulative capacity be a relevant uh, unit? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So basically, it depends on what you're looking at. But um, yeah, so the original application of learning curves was for um, kind of describing um, increases in in production or in, within a manufacturing process so a reduction in costs within a manufacturing process and so in that case for example um you would just look at reductions in costs due to the number of units produced so if you're looking at um capex and lcoe cost reductions you can I, I i believe that it is also an option to look at per unit of whatever it is that you're um manufacturing or deploying yes okay so from that i understand it would basically change your learning rate depending on the size of yes. your okay okay um i think for now this that's the questions for this question session so thank you thank you great we'll move back to me for the next part then um so following on now we've covered how learning curves can be quantified and calculated the next section focuses on how learning curves are used so learning curves are used um, to quantify historical cost reductions and um, to predict future cost reductions and to calculate the investment required to achieve these cost reductions 
In this section, we'll give examples of how learning curves are used in this way by researchers, uh, technology developers, and policymakers. So over the following slides, I'll talk about how learning curves can be used to understand historical cost reductions using renewable technologies such as solar PV and onshore wind as examples, how they've been used to forecast future cost reductions in offshore renewables, and how we can use them to estimate the investment costs required to meet cost reduction targets. So here we see long-term cost reductions for a number of different technologies, shown as progress ratios. Um, remember, progress ratio is the additive inverse or one minus the learning rate. As Anna mentioned previously, learning rates are represented by the gradient when shown in log log plots. Um, it can be seen that different technologies have demonstrated different learning rates historically. Uh, solar photovoltaics, for example, has achieved higher learning rates than wind energy, as shown in this plot. And it can also be seen that different technologies have very different starting costs and different capacity and production levels at which sustained cost reductions reached. This graph shows historical cost reductions for global average solar PV module prices in blue and for um, onshore wind project costs in the USA in red. <laughs> We can see the best fit for average long-term cost reductions of these technologies with time as a straight line uh, with the associated learning rate included as well. But it's good to highlight this actual data doesn't consistently follow a single straight line or a single learning rate. Instead, we see points at time at which cost reduction has occurred more rapidly and points where there's very little cost reduction for continued deployment, sometimes even costs actually increasing due to technology developments and market prices of key materials and components. In practice, cost reduction doesn't occur consistently with a smooth learning rate. And these data show us that historical learning rates should be calculated over very long timescales, here decades and gigawatts of deployment, for us to be able to understand the true learning rate of a technology. As such, the learning rate is a long range strategic concept rather than one which is suitable for short term decision making. A learning rate calculated from just a few years of data or a small number of deployments likely doesn't tell the whole picture in terms of the lifetime cost reduction of the technology. Sometimes we can see the impact of radical innovations creating a technology structural change within learning curves. These graphs show examples of this. A radical innovation in offshore renewables could involve the redesign of a component or operation which would significantly reduce costs or improve device performance. A technology structural change can result in an impact in the long-term cost reduction potential of a technology, allowing a transition to a different learning curve. Following on from those examples of historical cost reduction, a key focus of developing technologies such as offshore renewables is predicting future cost reductions. The prediction of future cost reductions is of particular value to technology developers looking to ensure future investment and policymakers looking to direct policies towards technologies which have the scope to become cost competitive in the future. This can be done by expert assessments or by making assumptions based on past cost reductions. Anna will talk a bit more about the limitations and uncertainties associated with predicting future cost reductions in the next section. This graph shows the forecast cost reductions from a number of tidal stream technology developers around the world, following detailed questionnaires from the International Energy Agency Ocean Energy Systems Technology Collaboration Programme. They asked developers to forecast costs associated with future commercial deployments. The blue dashed line on this graph shows the industry average cost reduction assumption of approximately a 10% learning rate, whilst the red and green lines show plus or minus 30% on these cost reductions. It can be seen there's a considerable range in predictions, highlighting the challenges associated with forecasting cost reductions. Another study of particular interest is the offshore renewable energy catapult cost reduction curve for tidal stream, shown here in yellow. These cost reductions these cost reduction forecasts were also conducted based on in industry interviews and expertise. They project that tidal stream could reach an LCOE of 150 pounds a megawatt hour by 100 megawatts deployed, 130 pounds a megawatt hour by 200 megawatts deployed, and 90 pounds a megawatt hour by a gigawatt deployed. Here, the cost reduction figures are shown to fall between a 15 and 20% learning rate. Finally, we see the cost reduction forecast for floating offshore wind produced by Wind Europe 
these correspond to approximately a 15% learning rate on average and project a levelised cost of energy <clears throat> of 70 euros a megawatt hour could be achieved by 4 gigawatts of deployment. Finally, learning curves can be used to calculate the investment cost required to reach a target price point. This calculation can be a useful tool for policymakers looking to support low carbon generation technologies to understand the budgets required for future grants and technology subsidies. When we say investment cost, what we mean is the total investment required to reach a certain cost reduction. In this example, we aim to achieve a levelised cost of energy of £150 a megawatt hour from a starting point of £300 a megawatt hour and assume a learning rate of 10%. Based on this assumptions, this cost reduction will be possible by around 800 to a gigawatt of deployment. Sorry, 800 megawatts to a gigawatt of deployment. The total investment cost to achieve this cost reduction is the total of all of these lifetime costs of the cumulative deployment. As the levelised cost of energy of 150 pounds a megawatt hour is the aim here, the investment costs will need to be calculated, taking account of the energy generated over time based on the device performance. So this graph illustrates just a simplified representation of the investment cost calculation. The total investment cost is very sensitive to the learning rate that can be achieved. Here we show the comparable investment required to reach £150 a megawatt hour at a 20% learning rate on the left and a 10% learning rate on the right. The cumulative deployment required to meet the target cost reduction is around 80 megawatts for the 20% learning rate and over 800 megawatts, so more than 10 times as much for the 10% learning rate resulting in a considerably higher investment cost. However, if we're able to undertake innovative step changes with our technology, then this total investment cost can also be reduced considerably, just to find continued funding for research and development alongside deployment. This allows us to stimulate technology structural changes which result in a step change in cost and performance, illustrated in red in this graph here. So I think that's the content for, for that part of the um, section. I don't know if there's any further questions at this point. Thank you, Shona. Um, so I have a question in terms of the context of investment. So in what context is investment cost calculated and used? So could you give me an example of who would do this and for what purpose? Yes, yes. Um, so this calculation could be done, for example, by a policymaker that wants to set a feed-in tariff which will allow a low carbon technology to recover their long-term costs, but wishes to estimate, for example, like the budget required for such a scheme. Um, and these kind of market pull mechanisms such as feed-in tariffs will be discussed, I think, in a bit more detail in tomorrow's session as well. Okay, great. Thank you. In terms of this question session, I think that's it. Thank you. Great, perfect. Um, in that case, I think we'll pass back to Anna. I think you should be able to take. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just looking at some of the questions, and I think they might, some of them might be answered uh, just now. So now that we have seen how learning curves are defined and how they can be used. We would like to discuss what are the uncertainties and limitations associated with them. And I believe this, this section will address some of the questions that were asked already. So, if it works. I... I don't seem to be able to pass the slide. No, okay. Thank you, Shona. Um, so yeah, here you can see um, the list of uh, topics that we will uh, discuss just now within this uh, topic of uncertainties and limitations of learning curves. And we will start with the idea that cost does not always represent price. Why is that important? So when applying learning curves to energy generating technologies to assess if they are competitive in the energy market, ideally we would be comparing their cost to generate electricity. 
However, often only price data is available. And so price data um, are not only based on production cost, but also on the marketing strategy, the demand, the height of the available subsidies, etc. And so Boston Consulting Group came up with this graph describing how the relationship between price and cost changes over different phases of the development of a product. And so you can see here that only at the final stable market phase of a product, prices and costs would decline at the same speed. And so only then prices can be used to estimate cost reduction rates. And when applying learning curves to forecast cost reductions in emerging technologies, this stable market phase has most likely not been reached so that using prices to represent costs might not be completely representative of the cost reductions. Additionally, market, the, the market situation may change over time so that this relationship between this relation between uh, price and cost could change after a stable phase was reached. So in summary, using price to represent cost is our first approximation here that we need to be aware of. And this uh, kind of brings us also to the next point, which is how do we know when learning begins? Does it depend on the development stage, on the amount of deployed capacity, or how can we, how can we know that? So if we were to draw the learning process in terms of how costs develop with cumulative capacity or cumulative production from the R&D stage, it could, uh, it could probably look something like this, where in the beginning, new concepts are introduced that may or may not result in a cost reduction or may not immediately result in a tangible cost reduction. And as we move on through the development stages, through the prototype to the demonstration to the pre-commercial stage, the uncertainty calculation of the costs is reduced, but consistent cost reductions might not, might, might not uh, yet be achieved. And there is no answer to when does learning begin, actually, but it is generally, or there's no answer yet, uh, but it is generally believed that consistent cost reductions will not start with the first unit of production, and so generally learning curves do not start with the first uh, unit deployment. So if we look at the learning curves that we were looking at before, we can see that if uh, consistent cost reductions do not start until later stages, more capacity will need to be deployed until the same cost reduction is achieved. For example, to achieve an LCOE of 150 pounds per megawatt hour with a 10% learning rate, if learning starts after 10 megawatts, as on the graph on the left, this will occur after the deployment of 1,000 megawatts, where if consistent cost reductions do not take place until 60 megawatts have been deployed, about 5,120 megawatts of deployment are required to achieve an LCOE of 150 pounds per megawatt hour, which is more than uh, five times the amount of uh, installed capacity. And this means that if innovations do not take place early for consistent learning to occur, much larger investment con costs can, can be expected. So apart from, oh, sorry. I hope that was clear. So apart from defining when learning starts to be able to estimate what the investment cost uh, will be to achieve the cost reductions. It may be challenging to make forecasts for cost reductions for emerging technologies where little historical data is available and so where it is very difficult to define what the learning rate would be. So the next question we would like to address is how can forecasts be made for technologies where there are not enough historical data to be able to actually calculate the learning rate. And so a few, a few approaches have been suggested in this case, which include one using learning rates from similar technologies, although defining what is a similar technology might not be straightforward. Two, using component-based learning curves, that is defining learning rates for different system components where more detailed data might be available and then calculating the overall system learning rate based on the single component learning rates. And finally, using expert assessment. And the example shown here was applied to offshore wind, where, as mentioned before, learning curves could not be defined through standard approaches due to the large uh, 
price fluctuations in the past. And since until now we have take we have been discussing cost reductions and innovation at a rather abstract level. At this point, we would like to show you how single actors may think about these cost reductions and how in practice they might aim to achieve these cost reductions. So single companies may also define their own innovation paths based on their experience and vision of what is required to achieve the expected cost reductions. For example, Atlantis, a tidal energy developer, identified three main steps to reduce the levelized cost of energy of their machines. And this included first increasing rotor diameter from 18 meters to 20 meters, thus increasing the rated capacity to two megawatts and improving yield by 25% per turbine. Uh, secondly, replacing gravity bases with monopoles, reducing the steel requirements by 90%. And finally, performing array optimization, adjusting the turbine configuration so that multiple turbines are connected to one single export cable. And they expect that increasing the export cable voltage, um, the voltage rating, sorry, from 4 kilovolts to 33 kilovolts will reduce electrical losses to the grid by over 6%. Similarly, Ocean Energy Europe, for example, has defined their sector-wide vision of what will be the required main steps to follow at different stages of development to achieve the expected cost reductions. And for example, based on Ocean Energy Europe's vision, at early design stages, the goal is to reduce costs through increased technology performance and improved operations, which means improving the basic technology design, for example, through R&D. This is then followed by lowering finance costs as risk is reduced. Once the basic designs are chosen, matured and the risk, uh, larger machines and projects can be deployed, making use of cost reductions associated to economies of scale. And as an increased capacity has been deployed, economies of volume and so mass production and standardization might drive further cost reductions. Um, this shows not only how particular companies or organizations see these cost reductions happening, but also that different learning drivers may have a stronger or weaker impact on cost reductions at different uh, stages of development. So after this detailed introduction to learning curves and their use and limitations, we would like to discuss when, they sh when, when should they be applied and if there are other approaches that might be useful for, for different purposes. So when should learning curves be applied? Learning curves may be useful for a number of purposes to technology developers who can use projections obtained through the application of learning curves to predict and justify the expected long-term cost reductions to potential investors. And for this purpose, having a consistent method to perform these predictions is key to, give, to, to gain investor confidence. Linked to that, project developers and investors can then use these learning curve projections to calculate and forecast costs and profits. And finally, and quite importantly, learning curves are a key asset to policymakers who will rely on this for decision, uh, sorry, they, they rely on this for decision making between technologies for, for technology specific policies. And learning curves are used in energy system models and so are important for planning and defining targets and the required policies. So despite their limitations, they have imp an important application cases for which they need to be developed as consistently as possible. However, as we have discussed today, learning curves for emerging technologies are difficult to define, define and they don't provide any type of information on what measures would be required that would result in the expected cost reductions. For this reason, going back to our schematic showing different approaches used to assess innovation processes to understand the required innovation process and policies, more qualitative approaches that provide more context, such as the technology, technology innovation systems and learning pathways, may be uh, useful approaches to better understand the required framework to achieve these innovations. 
And since learning curves are still useful in other contexts, ideally, the approaches should be combined for emerging technologies so that learning curves that are defined, um, so that learning curves are defined informed by uh, this higher level context. And finally, we would like to highlight a few things to consider when applying learning curves that we wanted to, to highlight. So first, when defining learning rates, they should be calculated based on long-term historical cost reduction data under a relative, relatively stable market. Secondly, bulk discounts and considerations of economies of volume are often implicit within historical learning rates, and so care should be taken if applying these separately to avoid a double counting of these effects. And finally, for emerging technologies, sorry, for emerging technologies, applying learning rates from similar technologies is linked to uncertainty since it's not straightforward to define what are similar technologies. And so we would recommend the component-based approach when possible in this context. And I think now it's over to Shona for the final point. Thanks, Anna. Yep. And perfect. So yes, now we've spoken about how learning curves are calculated and used and some of the uncertainties and limitations associated with using learning curves. Uh, finally, we'd like to talk about how we can maximize, um, well, apply some of this knowledge really to maximize future cost reduction and learning potential for offshore renewable energy. So how do we maximize learning potential? Um, to do this, I'm going back to the sources of cost reduction that Anna um, spoke about earlier. And these feed into learning potential. Think about how, we can think about some, how these concepts translate to offshore renewable energy um, development. So I'll start with learning by doing. Um, cost reduction can be achieved through deployment in a number of ways um, by economies of volume as components and manufacturing processes take place in bulk, um, by optimizing offshore operations to be as efficient as possible through repetition and experience, and learning how to reduce instances of failures and thus improve the reliability of devices to minimize the number of operations required. Pre-commercial technologies such as floating wind, wave and tidal stream generation still need funding to deploy as they cannot recover their long-term cost, long costs from wholesale trading alone just yet. This funding could come in the form of research grants for technology prototype developments or by market support mechanisms such as feed-in tariffs which provide subsidies relative to the energy generated by the project. Tomorrow's session will focus on these funding mechanisms in more depth. Next, we move to learning by research. Learning by research can also be required for innovative step changes in technology development, which result in significant cost reductions and performance improvements. Competitive structured innovation programs such as Wave Energy Scotland are a great example of how research can be focused to develop pre-commercial components and devices which develop, deliver step changes in cost and performance. The Marina 2 project through which we're running these courses also gives access to a number of test centres around Europe and has enabled a great deal of research and development to take place in the ocean energy sector. Next is learning by adaption. This involves knowledge and experience transfer from other sectors. Offshore renewables have a number of synergies with other renewable technologies such as offshore wind, sorry, onshore wind, and also other offshore industries such as oil and gas and shipping. Adapting mature components and services to offshore renewable technologies, ensuring best practices are taken from other sectors can result in accelerated technology development. Another opportunity for learning by adaption is by developing offshore renewable technologies for a range of markets. As well as utility scale electricity, offshore renewables can be adapted for niche markets such as islands, microgrids, remote locations, heating, cooling and desalination. Learning by interaction takes place through collaborations and knowledge exchange platforms. This slide shows a number of such platforms in the UK, Europe, and globally. 
Learning by interaction allows for sharing of best practices and lessons learned, so mistakes don't necessarily have to be repeated, and successful technology developments can be shared. Learning by interaction can ease requirements for research funding and for subsidies, ensuring that technology developments aren't funded entirely independently multiple times over. Finally, cost reduction in the offshore wind sector has already been accelerated by increasing the size of wind turbines. This allows for increased energy yield and optimization of marine operations. Wave and tidal technologies have more limited scope for upscaling due to the nature of wave and tidal resource and the loads associated with the submarine environment. But as Anna highlighted with the Atlantis case study earlier, there are a number of de developments currently underway looking to improve energy yield by scaling up of rotors and turbines in the tidal stream sector. So this brings us uh, to the end of today's session. Um, to summarise some of the key outcomes, we've spoken about how innovation can be defined as a product or process which is novel and has some societal or commercial value. Innovation is particularly important to the energy sector as we move rene renewables offshore to meet long-term carbon reduction targets and need to develop commercial solutions for offshore renewables and achieve significant cost reduction in the future. We also focus particularly on single factor learning curves and how we can use these learning curves to quantify cost reduction and the long term benefits from technology innovation. We spoke about how learning curves are being used to quantify historical cost reductions, predict future cost reductions and calculate the investment costs required to reach specific cost targets. We also focused on the sources of uncertainty and the limitations associated with quantifying cost reduction through learning curves and forecasting future cost reductions. We've also suggested some best practices for how learning curves should be applied. Finally, we spoke about how we can maximise learning potential and learning rates through deployment, innovative research, experience transfer from other sectors, collaboration knowledge exchange programmes and by upscaling devices. So thank you all very much for listening. Uh, we hope you found the session interesting and we'd be happy to answer any further questions that you might have. Thank you, Shona and Anna. This is very interesting and, and uh, well done. Um, so I have a few more questions for you. Um, I'll start with uh, one for, I think, Anna, but maybe you can decide. Uh, so you have discussed how learning rates should be applied. Are there any examples of how they could sometimes be used incorrectly or where learning rates are misrepresented? Yeah, so I, I'm i not sure I would say that they are used um, incorrectly because it's sometimes difficult to tell, but I would say that they are applied, they might be applied inconsistently in literature because in some cases it is not clear if the, for example, the learning by doing um effects and the bulk discount factors are considered separately and some sometimes it's not clear if they they are being double counted or not um the most important thing is that um often not all information is provided that would be required to really understand what were the underlying assumptions for example when when learning was assumed to start what data were used to calculate the the learning rate, um, what type of learning curve was applied, what parameters were used to estimate it. So I think that it is important, or what I would like to, to highlight here is that it is important when applying learning curves to always state the underlying assumptions to also improve consistency in their application. And so if we're applying them consistently, we can improve comparability between different projections and different technologies or forecasts and then with that we can also increase confidence in these cost projections and with that confidence of, for um, investors. So I would say that it is not clear if they are applied incorrectly because most of the time uh, not enough information is provided to really understand um, how that co cost projection is, is done. Yeah. Okay. So no, similarly to, to yesterday I guess. Um, highlighting the transparent. yes <laughs> great um, and then I have a question on on the use of learning rates is it 
the question was, is, is it an input to calculating the LCOE or does it go beyond the calculation of LCOE? The application of learning curves. Uh, of, yeah, or learning the learning rate itself. Okay, so, so you would calculate the LCOE of a technology today without um, requiring use of learning curves if you wanted to, so now talking about, I'm thinking of Tidal and wave energy technologies. So if you wanted to then calculate what the cost could potentially be in say 2030 or 2050 with an assumed amount of technology that you would have deployed or an assumed amount of R&D investment that you would get, then you apply learning curves to calculate what that LCOE value in the future could potentially be. Yeah, and for um, more mature technologies, the learning curves are used to understand, could be used to understand how the LCOE, or, or to find a trend for how the LCOE changed over time. Um, but it is not an input to the, I would say it's not an input to the LCOE calculation. It's kind of a, a different step. I don't know if it's clear. If not, please write another question. <laughs> um, so the other question is, which is quite building on this, I would say, um, in terms of investment. So maybe this one for Shona. So using, how can you use this learning curve or, or uh, learning rate and then the learning curve based on that um, to attract investors to invest in a project? because with taking into consideration that at the moment, maybe the the cost of LCOE is quite high and we're sort of at the start of, of learning. Yeah, that's a great question, yeah. I think, um, I guess, yeah, the key thing is that if you have a good confidence in your current LCOE and your current technology, then a tool developers can use is using these learning curves to say, um, they can forecast future costs um, and attract investors based on the fact that they can justify their cost reduction. So, for example, the um, case study that Anna produced of Atlantis, they have specific technology developments that are justifying cost reductions in the future. And being able to also look back at other similar technologies, um, other renewable technologies like wind and solar, to say that they have also achieved those learning rates in the past that de technology developers are projecting for the future is can also be a way to kind of validate that so um you can use yeah learning curves in a number of ways to try and stimulate investor confidence and in, in your cost reduction of your technology in the long term okay great thank you and then i have another question on on terms of in terms of limits so what would be limits of learning uh, will there be a maximum learning rate or a maximum possible amount of cost reduction yeah yeah so i guess if you think about kind of current devices if you're trying to project um future cost reductions there will of course be limits as to how much those existing devices in their existing form can reduce like there's only a certain amount that you'll be able to pay for raw materials like steel there's only there'll be a minimum amount of operations that you're able to do on that device every year just to ensure reliability and safety and a minimum amount of crew available on those boats but i guess this is potentially where innovation can play a key part. For example, if you wanted to develop a new component that was perhaps a novel material which could reduce costs or reduce the amount of steel in your final device, or for example, if you wanted to use remotely operated vehicles to do some of your inspection, um, then you could yeah, potentially use innovative solutions to try and reduce cost, um, and that would have a much greater scope for cost reduction as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I think I'm gonna uh, ask a final question. We've had a few questions on uh, values of learning rates. Um, you have very much shown us the approach you can take based on historical data and, and other uh, factors that if you don't have that historical data to determine it. Would you could you give us a range of, of learning rates that you would consider for um, ocean energy? I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> Who's taking that question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, I mean, there's not, so it's difficult to give a num numbers because it will depend on um, what you're looking at, if LCOE or CAPEX um, against what first. Um, in general, typical values of learning rates, but this is not, so you would need to really check what is it that you're looking at in comparison to what other people have looked at, um, range between, let's say, 5 to 20 percent. That could be a, a range, five to, well, it could be 30 percent, but again, it depends on what you're looking at. So the overall range may be 5 to 30 percent, um, or, well, 0 to 30 percent. Um, and then, as we said, so if you have a mature technology, you would use um, regression of historical data to calculate your learning rate. If you don't have enough historical data, then we would recommend, um, as we said, using this component-based approach or what is also commonly used for emerging technologies is this expert assessment. The Using a similar technology, the learning rate that was already used for a similar technology, this is, as we said, a little bit more, there's more assumptions that go in there maybe, and so um, we would not necessarily recommend that, and it has been done for particular technologies, if I don't remember wrong, for CCS, I think that's the approach that was used, um, but it also depends kind of on the characteristics of the technology. So, for example, for batteries, I believe that what they used were component-based learning rates, rates because it is easy kind of to split a battery into different um, subsystems. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry to not be able to give you the number. <laughs> There's not the number. Um, no, that's but, all good. Uh, yeah, I guess what you would be expecting would be something between 5 and 30% if you want to, to have a range. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that was a good overview and, and a good starting point for people to look for for values and um, be transparent in their in their choices there. Um, so I think with that, uh, I would like to end the webinar for today. Uh, and we hope that with this second day of the course, uh, Anna and Shona have given you a great overview of the aspects that are related to uh, learning and innovation um, and again we know it's a lot of information here and um, so to repeat again this uh, the recording and the slides will be made available at a later stage and you will receive an email uh, when it's available on the Marina 2 website so thank you so much Jona and Anna for your presentations I think it was very thorough and, and a very good starting point for everyone trying to determine learning um, so and then I hope uh, for the attendees uh, that you'll join us for our uh, webinar tomorrow which is on project feasibility and uh, software tools with uh, Jose Canido and Donald Noble and Tiana Lois Tomas thank you